Life Lab. I hope you're having a great time. Um, this is the second year we've been having these uh, 10 dB uh, series concerts. And the feedback we got last year was that people wanted to hear a little bit more science. So what we did this year is, is every concert uh, we have one of us gets up and uh, talks a little bit about some of the research that we do. Uh, and so tonight's my night. And um, I thought that given uh, the amazing rhythms that you're hearing tonight, it might be interesting to look a little bit about the science behind rhythms, how we process them in the brain, and why we have rhythms at all. And so when you think about it, most biological systems are rhythmic. Uh, so locomotion, we walk rhythmically, our heartbeats are rhythmic, we speak in uh, using rhythms, music of course is rhythmic. So really, there's rhythms everywhere. And why is this? Why are rhythms so powerful? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a few reasons. One of them is that rhythms have a regularity to them, and that makes them predictable. So if I tap one, two, three, and you have to tap on four, you know exactly where to tap. So because of that regularity, you can predict when the next beat is going to occur before it's even happened. And uh, one of the things that we always do continuously is try to predict the future. So whether it's long term, you know, trying to predict the stock exchange or what's going to happen next in the U.S., um, or on a short-term basis, you might be, in fact, your brain is predicting what word I'm going to say next, and a lot of the time you can predict from the context what word I'm going to say next. Um, your brain is always doing that. In fact, you can think about the brain as an organ that's constantly trying to predict its future, and when it's wrong, that's when it triggers all kinds of extra processing, because that's when you learn something. When you were incorrect at predicting what was coming next, there's something that your brain doesn't know, and it will try to learn it. Rhythms also uh, are very helpful in organizing information. So you have rhythms in music, and then on top of that, you can put pitches and phrases and so on. And in speech, you have a speech rhythm, and you can put phonemes and words and phrases um, onto that structure. So it helps us organize um, the sensory information. And this idea of predictability has another uh, consequence, which is that these strong beats that your brain is predicting, they become the focus of attention. And so, uh, for example, if you are playing some music and you're going to play a wrong note, don't play it on a strong beat, play it on a weak beat, because people will not be attending to the weak beats, and they may not notice you've made the mistake. But our attention is constantly fluctuating up and down, and rhythms provide that points uh, of attention for us. Okay, so I said we're always predicting the future. So, for example, if you're a sports fan, uh, say you're a basketball player, uh, and uh, this is uh, Russell Westbrook, who's a quite famous basketball player. This is when he was uh, playing college basketball. And what you can see is that his teammate over here has the ball. The, they have a common goal, which is to get the ball in the net. There's an open space here. So this guy is probably predicting that if he throws the ball here, Russell will actually move over there. Russell's predicting that he's going to throw the ball there and he's going to try and move there. So they're predicting the future. And if this guy on the other team doesn't also predict that, then his team is going to get scored on. So playing sports involves, you know, you have to be able to aim and get the, the ball in the basket and so on. But the most important thing in team sports is predicting what's going to happen next so you can be in the right place at the right time. Now that's true in music too, so if you think about playing music with somebody else, uh, you not only have to figure out ahead of time what notes you're going to play, because uh, if you decide at, the, at a certain point in time you want to play a note, it's too late, you haven't programmed the, the motor movement, you don't have your finger in the right place. So you have to think ahead of time about what you're going to play, but when you're playing with somebody else, you also have to predict what they're going to play next. Because if you wait and listen to what they play and you're trying to be with them, it's too late. So you need models in your head not only of what you're going to do next, but what all your fellow musicians are going to do next. So how do we process rhythms in the brain? Well, we know a little bit about it now um, from some studies we've done in the lab. And of course, 
when we look at something in the lab, we usually simplify it. So we didn't start with the really complicated rhythms you were hearing uh, in the music tonight. We started with just very simple isochronous, evenly spaced <coughs> beats. And what we did was we presented them at different tempos. So this is at a fairly fast tempo, or we presented them at a fairly slow tempo. And then we measured, uh, using EEG, we measured brain waves um, to figure out what was going on in the brain when people listen to rhythms. So you can take a chunk of EEG, so here's some uh, EEG, for example, and we can break it down into a series of components, uh, decompose the wave, the, this complex wave, into a series of simple waves, uh, such that some of them are at a high frequency, so they're varying really quickly, and some are at a low frequency, so they're varying slowly. And the brain, actually, brain uh, signals from EEG are really just a bunch of oscillations like that that we can analyze. And so here I've shown them in a little bit of a different form. We have time along this axis, and you can see these blobs here are the actual sounds that we played, so they're evenly spaced in, in time, so that's when they occur. And then what's shown along this axis is those different frequencies going from really slow frequencies to really fast frequencies. And there's a particular band there that turns out to be really important for processing rhythm in the brain, and it's around 20 cycles per second, so you get 20 oscillations a second, and we call that the beta band. And if you look carefully at the beta band here, the red is when there's a lot of power in the beta band, and the blue is when there's very little power in the beta band. And after the onset of a beat, there's a decrease in beta power. See, so it turns blue, and then it increases again to red just at the onset of the next beat. And that pattern repeats over and over again. So the brain is actually in training, the beta band in the brain is in training to this auditory rhythm that we're playing people. And if we slow it down, so now you see the um, times where the sound's occurring, still regular but slower, and what happens? Well, the brain oscillations slow down. The power in the beta band slows down. And if you just look now at a plot of that, just that 20 hertz band, what you see, these, these arrows are the stimulus, the, the sounds. So you get a decrease, increase, decrease, increase. At the slower tempo, you get a, an abrupt decrease after the tone. And then you get a slow increase to the next tone. Abrupt decrease and a slow <coughs> increase. So this increase here, that's the neural signature of your brain predicting when the next beat is going to occur. Okay, pretty cool. And if we look across the whole brain now, and we look where in the brain do we see the beta band in training to the auditory rhythm, well, we see it in auditory cortex. That's not so surprising. We expect the sound to be processed there. But we also see it in motor areas that control movement. So we see it in the supplementary motor area, these various movement areas, the cerebellum, and so on. So when you just listen to an auditory rhythm, it's not only your auditory cortex that is in training to that rhythm, your motor cortex is in training to it as well. And that, we think, is why music want, makes you want to move to the beat. So have you ever wondered why, like you're listening to a sound, why does that make you want to move to the beat? Well, because of these processes that we're discovering in the brain, that the auditory system is connected to the motor system when you hear rhythms. So just to sort of summarize this, we have these fast beta oscillations, 20 hertz, and if we look at how they in, the beta increases and decreases in power, that focuses our attention at these particular points in time. And we're much better at hearing what's going on at these points in time than we are at these points in time. Okay, so Tonight, we're not going to measure your brain waves. We can measure them in, in this space, but we're, that's not what we're going to do tonight. We're going to do motion capture tonight. And so one of the things that you might notice uh, about musicians 
is not only do they move, like if they have to play the piano, for example, or a violin, not only do they move their fingers to play the instrument, but they tend to move their whole body. So they tend to sway when they're playing. And you might wonder, why are they doing that? Uh, they don't need to do that to actually just play the notes. Uh, so we've been testing various musical ensembles, and this is the Griffin Trio, who's uh, one of uh, Canada's uh, finest uh, string trios. Um, and we had them come into the lab, and you'll see what they have on their heads, these mysterious caps that people keep talking about. And they have four little markers here, these little round balls, and the infrared cameras around the space um, shine infrared light on them, which you can't see, of course, uh, and that light reflects back, and they, they record uh, the, the, the light uh, reflecting off the markers. And then because we have cameras around the whole space, we can recreate three-dimensional models of exactly how the musicians are moving. And because when you move your head, when you move your torso, you move your head. So by just measuring the head, we can actually get uh, an indication of how the body is moving when musicians are playing. And our question here is, we think that the musicians are moving their bodies because they're using that as a way of communicating to each other. Now, they're not communicating exactly what note they're playing. What they're communicating is phrasing and expression and articulation and dynamics. And they're indicating to each other ahead, we think, of what they're going to play. They're indicating to the other musicians how they're going to be playing that. So how do we actually measure that? Um, well, let me just first show you a little video. One of the things we asked them to do was play the same piece twice. And once we had them play it expressively, the way they normally would, and then one, the other time we said, okay, play the same piece and play it really well, play it together, but don't, don't put a lot of musical expression into it. And I'm gonna play this for you without the sound um, and see if you can tell which version so these are the motion capture um, uh, recordings that we get. Uh, see if you can tell which version they're playing expressively. <laughs> so is it A or B? A, A right. It's a no-brainer. It's really easy to tell. Okay. So that tells us that, that they are moving when they want to play expressively together. And then we can use mathematical techniques to look at whether they're actually communicating with each other. So for example, we can use something called Granger causality. And so what's shown here uh, in the top is musician one's <coughs> movement trajectory, and on the bottom is the movement trajectory of musician two. And in fact, if you take just within a musician, say take this point in time, and you look at how the musician is moving before that point in time, you can make a prediction about how they're going to move next. Okay? But then what we do is we say, well, can we also tell from how musician two moved before that time if that affects how musician one is moving? So can we predict from musician two's movements here what musician one is going to do next? And it turns out that we can. And that's the communication between the musicians in action. And whether we play, whether they play a happy piece or a sad piece, this measure of group coupling, how well they're coupled together, is higher when they play expressively than when they play non-expressively. So this research that we do here in the live lab um, is showing us how the brain uh, encodes musical rhythms and how musicians communicate with each other uh, through their movements. So we might sort of take a step back and ask, well, why do we have music when we want to feel a common emotion? If you think about it, we have music at parties, at weddings, at funerals, religious ceremonies, political rallies, sporting events, and even in the military. So basically, any time that we want people to come together and f cooperate socially and feel a common emotion, we have music. So why is that? Well, there's a number of studies now that show that when two people move together in synchrony, afterwards, they like each other more, they trust each other more. If you give them a cooperative game to play, they cooperate more in the game. 
um, compared to people who were with each other for the same amount of time but did not move together in synchrony. So there's something about moving together with other people that has a social consequence for us. Um, and so we wondered whether young infants would already do this. So would moving in synchrony with another person also affect how an infant uh, felt socially connected to that person? Now infants are too motorically immature to actually move in time to the music themselves, although they will try. Um, so what we did in our experiment um, is we had uh, one person, this is uh, one of my students, Stephanie, and she's just the bouncer. She's just going to bounce the baby in time to music. That's her role. And then uh, Laura Sorelli, over here is my graduate student, um, who actually just got a job at University of Toronto, a tenure track job, so we're all really happy about that. Um, so she uh, is the experimenter, and she's either going to bounce in synchrony with the baby, or she's going to bounce to what she hears over a click track on her headphones, and she's going to bounce at the wrong tempo. And then afterwards, we're going to see if that baby is willing to help her. Okay? So I'll just play you a short video of what this looks like. experiment now quite a few times in different ways and infants are about twice they, they bounce for like three minutes with this strange experimenter that they've never met before and they're twice as likely to help her if they bounce in sync than if they bounce out of sync so that's a pretty powerful effect and furthermore it's socially targeted it's targeted at the person that they bounced in sync with because if they bounce with this stranger this other stranger here who never bounced with them, they don't help her more. So it's not just that the bouncing makes them happy and they help everybody more. They target their, their helping at that particular person. However, if we show them that the person they bounced with, so if they bounce with Laura here, and then we show them that someone else is a friend of Laura, they will help the friend. So it's not just the person that they bounced with, but it's friends of the person that they bounced with. So this moving in sync is a really powerful cue to figure out who should I trust, who should I befriend, and I'll befriend their friends as well. I'll befriend their, their social group. And in a way, this isn't surprising when you think about, say, teenagers who actually tend to listen to music a lot, uh, people listen to music most when they're teenagers in their early 20s, and then it tends to drop off after that. And we think that part of the reason for that is that's when kids are really forming their social groups. They're deciding who are their friends and who are not their friends, uh, and so on. And one of the cues that they use is they like to listen to the same kind of music as, as their friends. So music plays a really important role in how we navigate our social world.